if I see the minister is a coward, automatically I kick you out of my office. Because I know that you have got something wrong with you. To some, he was a strong, decisive leader. At his core, an African nationalist. But to others, he was simply an ignorant, vicious buffoon, the butcher of Africa, who sent hundreds of thousands to horrifying deaths. Idi Amin's life has recently been immortalized in the Oscar-winning feature film, The Last King of Scotland. But critics have suggested that the biopic is a work of fiction. So what is the truth? I may wear the uniform of a general, but in my heart, I am a simple man. I am you. Little is known about Idi Amin's earliest years. Even his birth date is a guess, sometime in the mid-1920s in northern Uganda. But it seems clear that he had a tough childhood. The mother, you know, my father grew up with the mother mostly. She never had a lot of money to take him to school, so he had to work. He used to go to work hard labor to get at least something to survive with the mother. He never went to school so much as we did because of that, the old days, money was hard and you know, things were different from what is today. His poor education may have proven to be a hindrance were it not for his burning ambition to succeed. He used to say, I want, I want to speak English like an Englishman, I want to write it like an Englishman. No, he, I think he aspired to leadership. He saw he was going into the leadership in the end. Yet when Amin joined the British Army, he was initially employed as a lowly member of the kitchen staff. Later, his size helped him gain fame as a boxing champion. Then he began to rise quickly through the ranks and learned along the way how to use brutality to quell opposition. Amin was a member of the serious King's African Rifles, which was the colonial arm of oppression. They used the army to subdue anybody that was saying anything that they didn't like. You know, if you, are, you try to claim for your independence in any, uh, in any way, then they would send Amin and his soldiers to come and deal with you militarily. So Amin grew uh, up in that situation where he knew that power, was, uh, power of the gun was very useful to subdue people. I am the best friend of British. By the early 1960s, the army had given him a nickname, Idi Amin Dada. The British made him an officer, one of the first Ugandans to reach that status. And after Uganda gained independence in 1962, Amin continued his ascent as a trusted aide to Prime Minister Milton Obote, who promoted him to general and commander of the Ugandan army. But this trust was misplaced. Amin had become the power behind the throne, and he eventually ousted Obote in a military coup. The international community, exasperated by Obote's mismanagement of the Ugandan economy, initially welcomed his removal. I think everyone, especially the British, who after all had run the place for decades, breathed such a sigh of relief when Milton Obote was overthrown when he was at a Commonwealth conference in 1971, when Edie stepped in and took over. Everyone said, thank God, it's over. Nothing could be worse than Milton Obote, the corruption. Amin promoted an image of a benevolent ruler who at heart was just a family man and a father to around 50 children. He's such a lovely man, so good, he's so loving, he has never, he never beats any children. He's, he, he's, when he's at home, he just wants us all to be on him. He's like, he's a mother, a father, a sister, a brother in one. <laughs> He 
he loved music, so he's always on his accordion and singing until he likes to sing. And one of the nice songs which every Idi Amin child will always remember if you want to know this is an Idi Amin's child, you just tell her or him, sing that song. If she doesn't sing that song, it's not. The song goes like this. Number one, two, three, four, five. Chalo chilo lela na mai ingwe. Chalo chilo lela na mai ingwe. Chalo chilo lela. You know? And then now, you know, and it's, it goes on. And if it, they, she says your name, you feel, oh, you're on top of the world, you know? Because it's you. And his old friends also benefited from their new president's generosity. I was walking from Ginger Town, going to the army barracks where the army shops were. And he saw me, he, he had a Cortina car, and he stopped in the barracks and asked me, why was I walking? I said, I don't have a car. He says, why you don't have a car? I said, I don't have money. He says, you come and see us tomorrow. So I went to see him, and he asked the army to give me a loan. I can buy a car. That's how I bought my first car. Ready, go. We would meet him occasionally at uh, swimming pools. He would, uh, would greet, hello, hello, that's been very nicely, he would greet. In fact, sometimes he'll ask my son, uh, give him ice cream, give him this thing, give him that thing, you see? He was quite friendly otherwise. But when you, it came to politics, I think he was tough. <laughs> But this toughness was slow to reveal itself to the wider international community. The outside world, especially the British, who were mesmerized by this seemingly knockabout character who seemed to have a sense of humor, although they misunderstood what that humor was, they allowed him to get away with things. They gave him too much leash, but, but it took a while before the penny dropped, before they realized just how goddamn awful things really were going on there. But so he had a, he had a lucky period before everyone realized that things were much worse than they'd ever had been before. Amin had become president through brute force, and he began to consolidate power using the same methods. Any opposition was crushed in the most appalling fashion. He fed his enemies to the crocodiles. He'd have the husbands of, of women he fancied. He'd have them murdered and shot on his own orders. He had people incarcerated by the secret police and tortured before being bludgeoned to death. So, no, he didn't really have a sense of humor except of the macabre of, of his own terrible, evil regime. And it's impossible for me to minimize just how bad this man was. People were killed, really nearly. My own brother picked from his office just across the river. He will never be seen. And many, many people, you know that, the Archbishop of Uganda, the head of the Anglican Church, and ministers were picked up and uh, executed uh, in cold blood, uh, in a f effect motor accident. The Chief Justice was picked from his chambers, never to be seen again. And uh, literally uh, hundreds of thousands of people were uh, taken in that way. So this river, uh, I could, uh, you could see bodies floating on that river every time you, you, you drove past. Amin's apologists insist that he was merely ruling in the tradition of all African leaders. In Africa, all presidents kill. You kill. So nobody should condemn Amin killed. Everybody killed. Even in South Africa, they kill. Everybody kills. And despite mounting evidence of Amin's atrocities, Uganda's former colonial rulers continued to turn a blind eye. There's no doubt that he had a love-hate relationship with Britain. He'd surrounded himself with some British advisers. He, he liked to make fun of them. He liked to exploit them. And he liked to show he was top dog. 
but all the time he was pushing them further and further into the corner. And I think he was just trying it on to see how far could he get away with it. What concessions could he win? Because he found that if he squeezed them hard enough and they gave him something, whether it was aid or special concessions or turned a blind eye to the latest horror, then maybe he'd get something even more valuable for, from them. But Amin was about to issue a decree so inflammatory that the British could no longer ignore him. 